Hey, greetings. It's Tuesday, time for Macro to Micro Power Hour. Thank you so much for joining. I am Samantha LaDuc, founder of LaDucTrading.com, and I'm really glad that you can pop in. We're going to talk about this commodity super cycle, quote unquote. Is it really? Um, or are we really just uh, the pause here before we reverse down? And we're going to talk about that to join me is Jonathan Gibbons of VigTech.io. Every Tuesday we do this, we get a topical theme and then we kind of dig into it. So let me make sure I've got Jonathan. There he is in his new digs. It's just every week you have a new splendid apartment. Yeah, this is uh, this is my, um, my SPAC office. <laughs> oh, I gotta start the video. Little details, little details. All right, little housekeeping too. This is actually interview, uh, webinar, podcast. We put it everywhere. Um, and you know it's Tuesdays. This Thursday I have a special guest, um, Barton Wang, who's going to be talking about uh, Treasury and uh, Fed money flows, basically the plumbing in the market and how that influences um, market volatility, but also direction, right, liquidity. So when this is done, um, this will be right here on Macro to Micro Power Hour. I'll upload this to my YouTube channel, which is Leduc Trading. And you can find uh, Jonathan at VigTech along with my indicators. And they've got some really cool stuff that they are launching very, very soon. Yep. So we keep updated on that. Any, any, any updates on that? Yeah. The, um, well, first I would say anybody that's got the opportunity to listen to uh, Barton on Thursday, that is a very, very smart guy. Um, he's got that treasury flow stuff down better than anybody I've ever seen. So, um, I got to talk to him last year a little bit. You connected me with him. He's, he's a great guy. So I highly suggest if some people have an opportunity to check that out on Thursday with you. And then, um, we are launching our, uh, new website later this week, and there will also be an early sign up access, early access sign up to our options matrix product, which we've been working on for the past three months. Um, I will uh, put out a landing page a link to that where people can sign up. Um, everybody that we have uh, kind of reviewed this with or what have you has been pretty mind blown with uh, what we've been able to create. Um, so I would suggest people sign up for that act early access and you'll be able to get a um, reduced rate lifetime rate with early access and also you'll be able to get it before everybody else does um about a week before we release it generally so that is something that'll be out on thursday um while we're wrapping up some stuff internally uh and that'll run for about a week to, to get access to it so look for those links that come out um vol as well will be making a comeback so don't call it a comeback but vol as well is coming from the twitter dead and he's gonna get back online. So I'm back out of the development cave and uh, be able to be able to ramble a little bit. And um, so we got a whole bunch of good stuff coming. And I think uh, with the current environment, with everything that uh, we have um, seen with the data that we're working with and the way that we're creating stuff, uh, you guys are want to try this out. I'd, I'd highly suggest everybody to, to try this options program out because it's a whole nother whole nother beast. So very, very helpful, very helpful with the way things are, are shaping up and going forward. No, cannot wait. This is going to be yep. um, definitely a big impact to active traders, yep. um, but also position traders. I mean, trying to really put in context data that we get an option flow to really what they're doing and the size, uh, just all the scans that we love to do every day yep. to have a lot of a lot of control. So this is exciting. All right. So you have um, suggested this topic today, which was kind of this commo commodity super cycle. We already know the banks jumped on this. Goldman, um, gosh, I think right after the, the Pfizer vaccine, Morgan Stanley came out with more support for it. So the banks have been in this mindset that the uh, commodity um, run that we've had is not over. And you were mentioning real estate in Florida is ridiculous. And I came across an article. Well, first, I want to bring this article up because it's a follower on Twitter who's um, a very successful real estate agent in Vancouver who's also um, an economist writing up this article that I read through and thought, this is, this is exactly what we're talking about today. So why did you want to hit this topic? So I was, uh, you know, last week I showed up with a hat and I was pretty, pretty disheveled to our, um, our uh, web, webinar here and um, podcast 
but people on the podcast didn't see that. But uh, I, I need to get a haircut. When I got my haircut last week, uh, and you know, trying to make it look better for you guys here. Yeah, the was talking to um, the girl that I've been getting my haircut for the past dozen years, and um, you know, let and she was telling me like all the folks in the area that are leaving their jobs to get into real estate. And um, the last time I saw that in Florida was in 07, yeah. um, where everyone became a real estate agent. And uh, so it was like- it was, you're, not, you're not far behind. There's actually statistically, there are more real estate agents in the past year than there are available houses for sale. Yeah, so like it was like in the top of mind just while I was, uh, you know, kind of let my mind wander this weekend. And then I was looking, at, so I talked to uh, another person that sells pipe fittings um, just anecdotally, and they used to give quotes for 90 days and they give quotes for 36 to 48 hours now. Oh, um, 48 hours. Wow. Yeah. The houses and, um, in the, in the kind of the, like I said, the urban core of, of Tampa, they will not build a house for less than three and a half million dollars. Um, where that was maybe $600,000 and up, um, just 12 months ago. Um, so like we're talking about raging, uh, inflation and supply chain, significant, uh, significant problems where we have talked about this, like, uh, a little bit, like anecdotally about just lumber and some other stuff the last probably like two months, but now it's like, you know, it's the point where, uh, some houses in some neighborhoods are up 50% month over month. Um, and you've got people leaving their, you know, careers and, you know, it, it is, uh, and at, a, at the same token, I was approached about, uh, you know, top shot NBA cards, uh, NFTs. And uh, I forget the other thing uh, that I needed to be getting into um, that uh, some uh, attorneys were, were, uh, were piloting. They were, they were all over it. And I was way behind the curve on these NBA top shot cards and baseball cards um, as well. So I think I, that's uh, my what a time to be alive comment. Um, right. Ah, as it really Okay. To- Cause I did see the, yeah. um, the Brady, like 200,000 card that went for <laughs> 2.2 2 million, like within the past, I mean, appreciation in five or six months. So yeah, collectibles yeah. are hot. NFTs, even, even, um, Sotheby's is doing an NFT auction. Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, you know, what a time to be alive. So like I, I'm, uh, I was talking about it in the context of inflation, um, because we're seeing it, uh, not, not, I would say so, uh, terribly much in oil just yet, but, um, you know, th- there is some significant supply chain problem. Um, builders are not, uh, you know, they can't take risk, which is causing housing to slow down. Um, and, uh, then you've got, uh, uh, property buyers that are a, a significant amount of like institutional capital getting into property. Um, oh, that was also yeah. like one in five single family homes. Oh, wow. Okay. Owned by a public company. Think big, right? They're yeah. a, a search for yield. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so, and then, we'll, you know, uh, we've seen, we, we, we've seen, uh, you know, as you're building the, the, the options piece out. Uh, we also saw, like you know, uh, you can kind of track the 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 real visualization of these flows that on a different level, and um, you know, it's just it's just all by side, and uh, you know, so I, I think inflation is is very real here, and it seems to be the uh, the the soup du jour that they really want that um, at any cost, and I don't think that anybody's really thought through the downstream effects of it as relates to housing and, and anything like that, vehicles. Um, Florida's a shortage of vehicles. But it's not just, right? when you say just here, meaning U.S., it's not. And this is actually the article that I was, uh, I just sent out um, in chat, which is basically, uh, again, a follower who mm. wrote this up. And I thought to myself, oh, I, I'm really curious. It is not just a housing bubble, U.S., Canada. It is globally. So mm. in particular, he's in Vancouver. So obviously that had um, craziness going on. But um, there is, you know, dollar volume of closed sales. Check this out. <laughs> Since 2005. This is- yeah, yeah, it's insane. You know, I, I and I think about it, it's, it's all over the world. And it, you, you look at it and, and you're, you're looking at a house that's gone up 50% month over month. I, I mean, that is, uh, that's, that's not, that's, that's hyperinflationary, right? That, not that's not sustainable, but at the that's same not sustainable. Time- uh, construction jobs also they had you know like a hundred thousand new jobs added and this is an area in the jolts that is expected to uh, be sustainable for a while in other words as long as this housing uh, tailwinds are helping there is 
there is hope that it's going to also build even more jobs in construction. Those numbers are off the off the charts as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It makes total sense. So I, I, the froth is not going away and it's oh and, no yeah no yeah. and it's definitely um you know speculative bubble they're talking about you know tightening in brazil and australia and other places that uh, you know in order to kind of tamp down some of this rabid speculation china was out um in the last few days saying we don't want banks to loan there's just too much un you know unsecured loans there's too much real estate speculation that's becoming um uh, kind of a policy to also start the tightening, maybe not the tightening cycle, but to try and get control of this speculation. Yeah, I, I mean, when faced with a the decision, they prefer inflation, right? Um, everybody would prefer inflation. All the all the central banks. So you know, I'm not I'm not surprised. And then as as things get more expensive, it's just they'll more fractionalize the system. Like you get the fractional shares. You have to, I can see fractional house ownership. Um, very easily at this at this pace for it to continue, um, and I actually somebody mentioned that to me last year. It's like as houses uh, become like less affordable, like uh, from an investment perspective, then maybe they uh, you own a sliver of twenty five houses in a in a neighborhood, like from BlackRock, right? Like you can own a, a ETF of of twenty five rental houses, uh, you know, and package them up. And somebody was actually trying to put something together like that. So but that was right before COVID hit. And so the people are already kind of talking in that context. So I think the longer interest rates run lower, which they will until something dramatically changes, then you continue to see housing like, you know, it just makes sense. It doesn't make sense to rent, it makes sense to buy, especially if you're um, uh, and we've seen a massive uh, supply of 25 to 35 year olds. Uh, moving to Florida to to purchase homes, right? So, and I think at the general in the South, and that is that's a generational push too. That's a demographic issue. So that that's that's a these are the first time home buyers. So, yeah, um, Logan had mentioned that in a in a real estate um, interview that I did a few months ago, where he said that millennial uh, tailwind is strong for the housing market until yes. about twenty twenty four. Yes. So, um, yeah, I agree with that. And lack of supply. It, very, very low inventory is also a strong tailwind. And then you have relatively historically low interest rates. That is a yep. strong tailwind. So his estimation, and he just is, you know, real estate um, economist and data analytics. It's a strong continuing trend for a few years, but it will have this effect of, you um, uh, need for tamping down because it, it it's not healthy if it gets too far too fast. Yeah, you know, income income has to catch up with this stuff. Um, you got to be able to uh, subsidize the, the the payments and with with the income and income isn't picking up. And so I'm wondering where that apex is. And I haven't done enough. I haven't done any research on that. So that's just me pondering, right? Like, uh, you know, you got nine hundred thousand dollar house, even though interest rates are low. First time home buyers, second time, you know, it, it, that's why you're seeing such a mad uh, rush to purchase a $500,000 house with 85 bids. Because yeah. what was a, you know, for example, we've had houses there, here that are half a million, now 1.3, right? Like, but this is, this is why, yeah. right here, right? You've got this, yeah. you know, home inventory, US existing inventory is down here. Like, it's unprecedented. And the, the median, sales price in the US of a home is up here. So those are those are large alligator jaws. At, at one point, they will converge. But for right now, they don't show a lot of signs of slowing. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's supply chains. Yeah, it, it can't can't produce them fast enough. Um, in the Sun, the Sun Belt states, especially. So yeah, I, I'm not a housing expert. That was all anecdotal. But the commodities piece is interesting, because I see like some basing in the in the precious metals. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been interesting to watch the last week, two weeks. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, you're seeing inflation in certain places and then, and then the, the real kind of places that you would expect to see it come roaring, roaring in, um, in the commodities in general, uh, it's starting, but it, you know, I kind of leave it over to you. It's like, is this the beginning of a, of a super cycle, right? Like, um, is that what we're going to be looking at here? So take me somewhere expensive. 
<laughs> Deep. <laughs> this is the amazing. running meme, right? We we talk about lumber. Like you've got buddies in the south that have these pro these mills. Yeah, and yeah. We already know lumber is what three times the price of what it was pre COVID. So this is, you know, anecdotally, we've talked about this, and it keeps rising, and supply of housing is, you know, again, so low and new. This is, I think, hysterical, but not, not for anyone who wants to start out. This is getting very, very expensive. Pension funds, yeah. yes, John is mentioning, yeah, started buying up houses and whole neighborhoods again. They were really big, BlackRock, in the, the bottom of 2012, right, the double bottom. Yeah. They came in, took a lot of distressed debt and, and houses, and they were brilliant. They nego I forget, actually, I think it was Deutsche Bank that um, helped them finance this. And then they would go with these ginormous contracts to GE, for example, for all new appliances. So they would basically, you know, flip these houses, and they sold extremely well, um, you know, into the highs, if you will. Not right now, these kinds of highs. But um, they did a lot of uh, scale in getting you know, massive appliance discounts and such. Yeah, this is this has been a, a an in, an asset category for publicly traded companies. Very hard, yeah. very hard then for young people to come in and actually get um, a house affordably. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting story. So, you know, you, the wages have to catch up, right? And you don't have inflation if wages catch up, but. Uh, you know, in that sense, the whole thing, $15 minimum wage and then pushing some other wages higher. But overall, the wages haven't caught up. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the with the commodities in general and what that really entails. Well, on the commodity side, I mean, I'm really curious how this is going to work out as well, because I'm looking at um, yields constantly and inflation expectations, and there is no lack of of bullishness on inflation expectations. I want to find that. I actually just did it today. I just tweeted it today where it's like five years. They don't think they're coming down. Now, of course, they can always talk that back. It's a little bit silly to have um, a five-year projection when we really can't tell. It's That's just silly. But I'm looking for this. If I can find it, I'll show it. It is this incredible um, narrative across the, the aisle that infrastructure is going to get passed more and more right today they you know boost to cyclicals on the uh, the senate um revised budget resolution which doesn't require filibuster and this is just more um you know driving the theory that we're going to have continued economic growth imf just came out today and said six percent globally um and the stimulus is going to help with this income inequality with wage, you know, by by increasing, if you will, wage inflation. We'll see if that actually comes to pass. But that's the mm -hmm. that's the big that's the big question. Will we get the wage inflation to actually um, help keep up with what's happening in inflation break evens? But they're they're higher right now. Mm. So that was something I actually put today in um, my client Slack channel. I'll grab that too because that was interesting. Oh, here it is. Let's do that two things. First, yeah, chart of the week. Will real rates follow the 2013 playbook? So this is a supply chain imbalances. This is basically, I think, Morgan Stanley saying this. Um, pent up consumer demand, an improving job market, a weaker U.S. dollar, ample credit capacity, and ongoing fiscal stimulus, all of which look poised to stoke inflation as growth improves. So still expecting strength in inflation and inflation expectations. Um, the other is going right down into, that's US dollar, hold on, here it is. Um, market implied probability that headline CPI, that was it, inflation is over 3% over the next five years. Like we're not there yet. But the expectation is that it will be over 3% over the next five years. Hmm. So these are all kind of, you know, supporting arguments on the economic side for um, this this commodity super cycle to continue. And this I grabbed just a kind of a, 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 a snapshot, if you will, on the 10 year break even like the 10 year right now, last three months, it's about one set 
The 10-year break-even is 2.35. Inflation rate is 1.68, which is just a little bit lower than the 10-year yield currently. There is still a lot of expectation, sorry about that, that we're going to have um, driving CPI for the next few months, and that's going to drive inflation expectations higher mm -hmm. and commodities higher. I see a pause that's needed, both in energy and definitely just commodities in general. They're really at um, some levels of concrete as it relates to resistance, just technically. So what are your thoughts on, on commodities overall? It just depends. Let me, let me, pull, let me pull charts. Hold on. All right, I got it. So, you know, it's, t it's twofold. You know, you've got a significant run and all this stuff, but it is as, as compressed as it was for so long, you know, how long have they been trying to stoke inflation? Almost 10 years. They, they didn't get like real, real goods inflation, sugar, you know, coffee, ag, timber, right? Like that kind of stuff, they didn't see it for, what till like in 1718 they were still trying and then you get back in the last three years and it was a big war and now they're getting it and it's it's like i was thinking about this the other day it really is everything is starting to go up from groceries to houses to cars to um you every single category of consumer is is consumer goods uh finished goods going up with all the raw goods going up all the raw goods and shortage situations uh across the board so those types of things are they they've been trying to gas that type of inflation for some time and get that to happen and it hasn't happened well they they got it to happen and they put so much into the system from a direct payment standpoint to businesses and like i think that the ppp has some impact to this too because the ppp went but it didn't necessarily go to wages and they've never audited any of this stuff I know for a fact there were people that took that stuff and just put it into other stuff and never spend it on, on a person. And it's not going to be, they, they, you know, they're going to audit it. Sure they are. But that, that's a massive amount, billions and billions of dollars. Then you got money that went into PPP that went into people's hands. Then you got money that went into people's hands directly. That type of fiscal is electric. And it was, a, it was, a, it was an amount that would stoke that inflation that they were really trying to get. I think they've stoked it and I think it's out of the bottle. I don't know that it's going to stop right here at levels. It may break or breathe, but if the demand, even with market structure, if the demand is higher than the supply is willing to deliver and everybody is in the spend environment, then, you know, prices go up. So I can, th I could see just from a macro perspective that this isn't done and that you're going to get some real inflation like real inflation. And I, I mentioned Griffin's article the last week, and that's in the same boat that they're in, like the, that, that is the risk here is real inflation, not controlled, uncontrolled, Correct. because yeah. you cannot pump direct fiscal. You can, you can control the quantitative easing type bank, direct to bank, bank holds, bank reserves. Like that's a bank gambit as it relates to reserves and loan issues. You know, and that's how they play that. The, you put it in fiscal and you put it in people's hands, that's not controllable. That's direct expenditures. And it went into businesses and people's hands and businesses that spent and businesses that didn't. I mean, you know, and they were given, I, I know many stories where people were been out of business or busted that went and got PPP and reopened again. Right. And they were actually out of business. Right. Because there was no regulation with this stuff. Right. There was not. It was just, you know, it was an emergency status environment and they just did what they needed to do. And I'm not judging at all. Right. I totally understand. It's very hard to execute in an, in an environment like that. So when you got that kind of uh, liquidity infused direct payments and then we're coming behind it with more direct payments, we got more money chasing less products. But that's also an argument right. for commodities. So as the money flows into consumer hands, but also just the economy in general, then you have this situation where uh, institutions want 
to front run the inflation, inflation. Yes. and then they buy <laughs> hard goods. So things yes. over paper, that whole theme yes. I had yes. on yes. last, you know, June and it has just How been- are you gonna solve the, the, the 24 hour, 48 hour pipe fitting problem? You gotta get more pipe produced. Well, you can't get more pipe produced, but right? Are, so it's going up. And, and it's not just the supply imbalance though. It's also the fact that we have this migration to you know the ESG movement, right? And I'm not talking just about electric mm -hmm. vehicles that mm -hmm. popped up like daisies and they got really, really hot. And then they came back down. That was a speculative class, but it's also this migration into um, you know, electrification has driven the need for commodities that we don't have in abundance. Yeah, so lithium and et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So th these uh, particular commodities are very important for electrification. And I think that that ESG movement has also spurred um, a movement into. But there isn't a commodity that it also it, the, every single one of the commodities that I looked at a while back. And I can't, there were only a few that weren't in a deficit. Yeah. So yeah. They weren't in a deficit. So you already had a situation where most of the commodities, you know, they just were out of favor. And I can show you the, the chart that shows why they were so out of favor. Um, for sure, hold on. We're talking multi, multi decade lows in commodities. Yeah, hold on. Keep talking, I'll find it because this is actually a really good one that I've shown before because it is just so stark, the um, representation of multi-decade lows in commodities and then some other ones. But I think, yeah, electrification is also another reason why, why commodities became in vogue. Yeah, I'm pulling up like, uh, let me look at something real quick. You look at grains, grains since August. But you know, 65%, right? And if you go back to, if I look at it on the weekly, the level's not seen since 19, right? Um, at all. Like, and they're breaking out of those levels. This not, they came back and retested it, right? Grains, copper, and yeah. oil are reserve supplies that countries buy up in abundance. And yeah. right now, China started driving that big time in copper. And also in grains, they also had a, a, a big pig problem, right? I mean, they had flooding, they had, you know, uh, uh, not the, the, um, the, the hog flu, forgive me, I can't remember what that was, but definitely they had to cull large amounts of pork, but they were buying um, in reserve. And we do the same, a lot of countries do the same. They buy heavily uh, to shore up reserves in grains and copper and oil. So that's definitely part of that play. This, I don't know if I can show it as clear but swine flu, thank you. Duh. All right, this is a multi-decade low kind of chart. I didn't make it all nice and pretty and grab it, but you can see it right here. So from, we're talking the 80s here. This is CRB, okay, the CRB index. This is a big, big, thick red line, 98, 2002. Relative to stocks, if you remember, because obviously with the NASDAQ, um, commodities, ex exploded higher. We had uh, oil up here. We had crude at about 140. Remember that? Yep. All right, so now here's crude negative 40 down here. Can you see this okay? Mm -hmm. so here is this concrete that I'm talking about. This is multi-decade lows, right? This is that was digesting and it completely fell apart. And this is a hook. And we've actually been doing a really great job. You can't see it, but right here of consolidating right above this massive trend, uh, you know, support area. Does that make sense? No, hundred percent. Yeah. Let me show you soybeans. You can look at the beans. Like I was like looking at soybeans, right. And then a big part of it. And it's the same thing. Like, uh, here, I'll pull it over. Go ahead. You got the, got the power. All right, here you go. So this is weekly, right. I'm going back to 13. Right. Mm -hmm. And you see the just the straight up explosion there in, in August of last year. And now on the weekly, we've you know completely extended and you can see the, the actual inflows are just really strong. This is very strong. Right. That means that flows on the volume basis on day over day basis. Never run any like kind of options verification on any stuff. But this is like a you know, momentum is just steady. The, this is this is raging moves. Right. Like maybe this pauses up here, but this looks more 
facing and then everything's breaking over from uh, a trend line standpoint, market structure standpoint. So I, this, these are, these are, uh, I, I don't find it. I don't find it any, any way coincidental that, um, uh, uh, Yellen was, uh, coming out about a new Bretton Woods, right? Like, uh, you know, I think that that's super interesting when you look at like right now, um, them wanting inflation and ha what they've had to do to ignite that. And that happened, you know, starting in, in August, September timeframe, about the time frame you would front run Biden, right? Uh, getting in there and having that total control over the fiscal and really pushing it the way they wanted to do. So it seems like uh, this is more of a, a bigger picture thing for sure. And I don't think the gas is coming off the fiscal. Like they were talking about, I heard something else about that the other day. Now I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell everybody like I'm all over that because I'm more into the the code side of everything than I am watching the the fiscal monetary conversation and policy. But like if they continue to stimulate direct, then these breakouts that you're showing, um, they're going to have some legs. Yeah, and th I, that's got real legs. So that's why that's why th this has been an early theme for trading, both you know chasing it, whatever moves. Um, there's been tons of, of option support, and yet institutions are not very exposed to energy. Um, energy as a sector, they were heavily exposed to tech, obviously, last year and this year, and energy outperformed all other sectors by 34% in the first quarter, and now institutions are saying, hmm, maybe, you know, I should have a piece of this. Kind of, so this is that commodities to S&P ratio where yeah. we're talking multi, multi-decade lows. So this isn't just CRB, this is CRB to SPY, and we're talking, there's tons of room to play catch up. Um, this is a chart that I do also on the 10 year when we have, you know, kind of like a trading range, and then obviously extremely oversold, and higher yields pull commodities up and vice versa. So we still have, you know, the inflation expectations with, with driving, you know, higher yields and in a rate of change that is very, very strong. To me, it still looks like we have um, a, a, a very strong case for, and we've talked about this before, a new regime of fiscal and monetary. This market is pricing inflation in by raising yields, and there's still a lot of room to go before it even reaches, you know, 1982 highs. Like, this is not even there yet. It's just coming off extremely, extremely oversold levels. So why wouldn't commodities rise with yields? They, they go together. They, yeah, they... 100%. And then big picture, I still like this growth versus value. I know I keep showing this chart, but that's September 4th where growth, think Apple and, all, you know, big tech, mid tech, um, they have just, besides intra, you know, intra week rotations, they are still underperforming. Um, you know, they're still falling down, if you will, and value is still being supportive. So I, I still see this rotation in play. And big picture, this is multi-decade. This is the reverse. Remember, I just showed you one of like CRB relative to SPY was all a decade lows. This is the same idea, but I use this because I think that whole concept of, you know, this is stock, uh, this is, I'm sorry, paper over things, and this is things over paper. Mm -hmm. That's basically what this shows, but on a really, really big uh, time paper. frame. Yeah, yes, big time frame. So, um, and I just, I think it's been really a very solid move since last summer. And it doesn't look like, I mean, the easy money might have been made, obviously, but it doesn't look over. Uh, it, it still feels like oversold relative to, hi to history. We have real assets 50% cheaper than their lowest point in years. So there's so much room for potential outperformance. Anyway, that's my that's my pitch on commodities, but I definitely think that we, as as we are hitting this, you know, level of resistance, um, it should chop around violently and chase a lot of the late longs. Yeah, agreed. Test the energy thesis, especially with oil. It's already down 15% since it tagged 68 bucks in crude, and it can still it, ha it still has room to fall and still be bullish in a trend. So I, I like the idea of value over growth for 2021. I still think commodities have a lot of, um, of, of juice left, but th when we get a correction, a sizable correction, momentum and value will fall, you know, just I think momentum will fall more than value, but everything will be hit. 
Yeah, I could see that, you know, overall. Like, I, I, I think that the question in my mind from a, like, let's just say macro trading perspective is what is the reaction to um, out of control inflation? Like out of control inflation. And, 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 the, and the entire thing that our assumption here has been, especially as we've been trained the last year um, since the since COVID, is that that whatever it takes, right? Not just a statement by Draghi, but just legitimately. Oh, we need more. Okay, here's here's another trillion, uh, another trillion, another trillion with T's, right? Not <laughs> B's. We used to get all of them, you know, flustered when they were talking three hundred billion more in QE. I mean, they do three hundred billion in a day sometimes, like now, you know. And so, so I go back to Griffin comment about uncontrolled inflation that would be the risk to market participants as a whole that forces policymakers to do something that they're not really prepared to do. Hence, I think the proactive thing Yellen is introducing to the conversation is we're ready for infrastructure prosperity like FDR era. We're going to um, build, build, build. We're going to, you know, do new bread and woods. I, I'm hearing like everything in the last 150 years that kind of work. Let's do it all at the same time. Like, you know, let's all get together and do a new bread and woods. And then we'll also do new infrastructure and everything. I'm not saying we don't need infrastructure. We've needed infrastructure for 45 years. But, you know, so inflation now being not really priced to run away like run away, like you accomplish your goal, but you did, it's the thing that you didn't expect that really kind of has to be priced in, which I don't really know that that's, you know, really, you know, you can't trade that. Um, but you, you can't trade protect, that, you have to but you have to protect against, against it. it and for Carl sure. asks the question, how do you hedge against inflation? And I would contend that that's what institutions are doing. They're front running this a commodity super cycle, if you will, and driving up copper and grains. Okay, oil had it has other issues, right? Sixty five above is is dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Producers mm -hmm. will start coming in and you know generating supply and the whole thing. But the point is that aside, um, I really think that that's what the the, the whole concept of things over paper mm -hmm. is doing. It's serving as a hedge. And yeah, yeah, business solid back. Yeah, the whole, oh, businesses, right? Like uh, businesses are like uh, consumer service type stuff. Um, like you see them buying houses. That's like, you know, that that tells you the, like the level of inflation they expect. No, um, I think that's yield. Yeah. I think that's a search for yield. They they yeah. have big dollars. They can go in and flip those houses. They know the supply. They, I mean, that's that, that was smart. They got great well, they, thing. They got great. Do you know thing. some of the backstories on that? Like uh, what Wells did. Wells actually, um, back in the day in 08, Wells went after and created subsidiary holding companies to create transactions to foreclose on people, right? And so it was a predatory deal. It wasn't smart. They were actually huge, huge bags of you know what. They actually created insurance policies and other things to issue to people that were necessarily behind but underwater but to put exactly, them in arrears. Yeah. And so they buried them. People. And now we have oh, a yeah, yeah. politically too, which right now it might be a lot of bark with very little bite, but there's no question it feels like a regime change of it used to be profits over people and now they're really looking to tamp down on that. It almost feels mm. incredibly regulatory is the environment is going to ramp up. I know nobody really believes it because SEC does nothing. And, you know, all this rules and regulations, they don't really go very far because that's our experience. But what right, right. if commodities do have a hot run with inflation? We get the the Michael Burry did a, a did a, um, an op ed. I forget where well, they took him off Twitter. They took him they off Twitter, but he had um, an op ed in was it Wall Street Journal? I don't remember, but where he said we're going to have the Weimer type inflation. Hyperinflation. Yeah. Hyper, hyperinflation. And it's coming in a few years. Um, and we don't know when it's coming, but that was his, his thesis. So there you go. There's that fear that is in the back of folks' head. What are they going to buy to hedge against that? Yeah. Bitcoin. Physical th physical things, you know, are, 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 I'd say like you look at real estate, 
as a, as a, as a physical asset, right? Is yep. it, or is it a paper asset? Because the people that are purchasing real estate are purchasing real estate on margin, right? And so when I go buy a house, yep. I'm putting 10% down as a new buyer of five and I'm leveraging 95%. So that's like literally, you know, Bill, Bill Wang stuff from last weekend, aren't you guys, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you look at that kind of leverage, that's housing. So housing's leveraged instrument in the United States. It's not a cash instrument. Cash instruments are cash instruments. So gold, silver, Bitcoin, where I'm taking cash and putting it into something and that instrument, I purchased it at a set price. I didn't leverage that unless I'm doing 10 to one. People like Bitcoin because they can go into Bitcoin and do these kind of um, uh, self exchanges for Bitcoin because it's unregulated. I can go in there and buy for $1, I can get $10 worth of Bitcoin. And so that's a kind of a, a levered up inflation hedge from everybody that I've talked to about it. And because we've been talking about it, and, you know, the crypto space ad and that kind of stuff, which we, we're totally going to do. But it's it's one of those things that gold and silver is their direct one to one. Oil, it's like one to one, but oil's, you know, got a commodities kind of spin to it. So it goes up and down related to supply and demand, geopolitical, et cetera. So I think that when you look at like, hard goods is very, very hard to say, you got it. I think number one principle to answer this question is in analyzing these things from our standpoint is, does something have a rehypothecation or a leveraged component to it? If it does, then is it really a hedge that we will not succumb to a debt issue, right? So if there's a, a systemic issue, anything related to debt is going to get hit very hard. Housing's being one of them. That's why housing really does not appeal to me as a hedge. It's, it is it is picking up, but it's picking up because it's levered up. And so okay. anything that's, that's levered up is fair. picked up. It's not liquid either. So there's danger. Very illiquid, very illiquid situation. Okay, so, so, you know, that's my two cents on like how, like I don't have a direct answer either. Like I don't have a direct answer. I think we should go get in this. I think that it's the, the leverage of the inherent instrument is very much something that has to be assessed. So you saw what uh, Archegos had and he had what, 700 leverage. So for every dollar he had at a bank, then he had the same dollar at another bank and another bank and another bank and another bank. How and else so, could he have gotten from 200 million to 2 billion? Oh, uh, well, you know, somebody actually gave that to him. So the banks knew he had it because the banks know that what the other guy has, they all go to dinner together. So, you know, <laughs> it's a, so, so effectively, everybody's doing the same thing with housing, right? So I'm buying a, a, a and this goes back to, my wage conversation. So I'm buying a house. I got a house. I'm making hundred grand. I buy a million dollar house, right? And the payment because the interest rates is X. It's on an adjustable. Here we go again. They lose control of it. They have to do something to stoke inflation, right? They do it. Now they've lost it, and they have to do something with interest rates. And it was. It's not what they want to do. It's not what they saw they want to do. And all of a sudden, because that's a debt instrument and on, on an ARB, right? So you, you actually have a, a margin situation with an adjustable rate. So it's like you're buying stock that's illiquid with an adjustable interest rate. And that's why I say it's like, so housing is out. Then you go, okay, so what about hard stuff? That's why I think you're seeing a lot of the sugar and the soybeans and the hoarding of and these the types of goods. Let's talk yeah. about coffee. Hundred percent. I think 100%. that's actually a solid um, solution on a few planes. So, for example, we we all know copper is like the economic indicator of growth or contraction, but it's also core to this electrification, the ESG movement. You cannot mm -hmm. have. In fact, we were talking about this. There's no energy conversion or transition without copper. So that is a. Um, I think a contributing reason why copper was bid up so fast and furiously in, in the last nine months, because it's not only a hedge against inflation, it's central to economic growth. It's central. I mean, you're dependent on it for the ESG movement. It makes perfect sense. And it's probably not done. Big picture. I've seen big, big, big options activity in the uh, US steel. That's steel well, that's as well, yeah. and and FCX, and even aluminum. They're yep. th those Freeport, are, yep, Freeport McMoran, and they're oversold relative to an Apple, which hasn't gone anywhere for seven months, kind of thing. Yeah. They're way oversold, even though they've they've increased probably a hundred percent from the bottom. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think the fangs fangs are not going to just drop unless you get a you get a um, some sort of volatility event. They'll just meander. 
because they're too they're too appropriate to pension or a taxable event you know or regulation event but you know they'll redistribute before they do that they, they, yeah, there be some volatility in the short short run like if they say you have to break up infrastructure yeah you know if you ever looked at the rockefeller thing i'd encourage everybody to go look at what happened after they broke up uh, rockefeller he ended up owning everything they broke up yes but but in the short term there's a lot of disruption yeah and then they you get know, they, longer I, after i i think i think uh you know amazon became too critical to fail now like everybody's uh they deliver most of the foods and goods They've uh, fleshed out a bunch of the distribution mechanisms over the past year, and they, you know, got even bigger with it relates to different subsectors. Yeah, so the they're too critical at this point. Out of the Fortune 500, didn't pay a dime in taxes, and that's what I think the political, you know, regime change is like. No, we don't want that anymore. We're gonna, we're gonna fix this. We'll. See. You know, I see, I see, like, you know, I, I can see that at the same time, like the accountants and lobbyists' job, right? Accounts, lawyers. And lobbyist job is to ensure that the, the the codes are written that way. So unless the and, and lobbyist accountants and lawyers all work for the corporations, they don't work for the government. So I find it it's such a stretch. Great, great talking point for the folks to want to bring it up that there be some change in that. But that would be literally ripping out the entire infrastructure of Washington, D.C. So it's like hard to see, hard to see that take place. I, I just don't I don't see it. I think more than likely infrastructure spending could be a great place to hide as you think about concrete you think about timber as it relates to having to build all the the lines fiber right all the raw goods that are related to 5g yep. stuff like that all those types of things are going to be done like because we have to compete with one belt one road and they i think that's one of the things that it's not being discussed here I actually track i started tracking one belt one road in the app and people can look at it um because the companies that are along the one belt one road there's some etfs that that index companies along one belt one road and we have to from an infrastructure standpoint like uh china has thirty eight thousand kilometers of light rail already in place and largest in the world and we have almost none um like there's so you would imagine that the infrastructure spending that's going to take place and they're saying it's going to take place might be a good place to front run because that money's going to go there from a fiscal standpoint that's direct in there. And those things will be goods that you can go target. And those are companies that pave PAV is a uh, ETF that's a global X ETF that's uh, dedicated to that kind of stuff. There's a couple others. I'll try and get them to you um, that I've seen pop up um, that are specifically related to infrastructure and bridges and things like that. So if the money's going to go there, it's fiscal money. We know it's direct, but the then that might be a place. The charts are gorgeous in infrastructure plays. Totally, yeah. yeah. Concrete or what have you. They have been beautiful trend trading vehicles without a lot of volatility. Um, you know, un, some are still under the radar because they're not momentum plays, right? They don't right. move so much. But they have been steadily grinding higher. Um, I just think that there's still a lot of opportunity. I mean, copper is still Agreed. trading at 2008 lows. I mean, it's still a great quote unquote long term buy. So I still like um, the idea that if, if the US is, is going to spend a lot more on supply chains, we got also, you know, the, e, the ESG movement. Those are two infrastructure. They're all going to be copper and metal, you know, bullish. So I think semis are a big watch um, for two reasons. Semis will lead tech. Maybe back if if tech is going to break out here because semis are back at the high. That's one. Two is uh, semiconductors are released to Taiwan. You know, semis still it's a it's a it's a it's a big X factor in this entire conversation of everything is that we are now becoming further and further more you know uh, the the Internet of Things and then software is eating everything. So the semis are becoming even more important, right? Semis are the new the new oil um, related to a lot of the global infrastructure that that island has to be monitored uh, as it relates to kind of a risk off as well. So if you're thinking about like everything as a whole, I'm looking at infrastructure, I'm, I'm hedging inflation. That's the, the choice that I want, everybody wants. Then the thing that could, has to be kind of kind of monitored in that aspect goes back to our conversation uh, back in November when we were talking about China, um, because now all things being equal, oh. the coronavirus is like leveled. Um, to an extent, I know that there's charts with it going around the other parts of the world. I, I get that and everything, but there's so much vaccine positivity results, et, et cetera, um, here, especially in the United States, that 
you got to assume that all think that's kind of an equal playing field. Now we're dealing with the global infrastructure and the advancement of uh, kind of the next leg in the AI journey, right? Um, so where's tech going? As software eats everything, I think that the semiconductor island—that's just what we call it—is is is really important to watch as it relates to all this. This chart is just fun because I talked about it recently um, with clients. Micron, look at this. Yep. It is a hair's you know move away from two thousand. High. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, and that that could be if that were to explode through that, um, and then base and then come back, that would be pretty uh, pretty and, serious. And don't and don't, don't judge me too harsh, but I still like Intel. No, no. I mean, you know, uh, have you ever been to the museum in, in um, the Intel Museum out there in uh, in San Francisco? No. Great. Everybody needs to do that. It's a it's a great uh, great lesson. Cool story. In interesting thing. So I'm an Intel fan. Okay. Well, I'm just looking at old economy, right? And yeah. um, networking as well. Cisco hasn't quite uh, taken out even 50% of its um, 2000. Yeah. No barring, problem. yeah. Barring something that relates boring to semis. Stuff is actually working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I say barring anything related to semis, right? Um, then volatility is, is totally in check. Um, and I showed, uh, if you, if you look at the SVXY, um, inverse volatility chart there's a, yeah. a big uh, big market structure hole about 15 to 20 percent higher that was left from last year yeah. and it's broken out of the 41 42 area um, which was the ceiling for quite some time so I could very much see vol um, right. you know maybe taking a break right here and, and and chilling out this particular chart or consolidating and taking a gun for that uh, 60 level right there. Um, if that were to take place and you You're could see SVXY, right? Yeah, SVXY. Yeah. So, so if you, hard, I have a hard time with this one. I see the channel. I see your argument. You know, this is the 100 week, which is typically a, a magnet and this is on a weekly. But when I look at VIX, I see this gap fill. This is again, focus on the weekly. Yeah, it did. Very yeah, it did. I mean, this is a gap fill. And to me, this has got like another week or two before it starts to get busy again. Well, you know, what's interesting is like this could, what I would tell you is that this might actually neutral, like become a little bit more like uh, kind of meandering rather than just, you know, totally vomit bag uh, falling out. And you could see some like underlying on the VIX because I am still for me from an option standpoint, the ETFs have been running what I call neutral. And so zero to one is like bullish, right? One to one and a half PC. I, I've over the last two years, that's really neutral. And then over one and a half is is fairly fairly bearish. The ETF index stuff, which is you know SPX, I would say you know is in there in that kind of bucket. That stuff is like flattening out, right? So you you see that start to change, but the underlying stocks themselves are extremely still wildly bullish. So you know you could see that where we've talked about it for some time, where VIX begins to base and rally as indexes uh, move higher. I could see that kind of terminating with the end of that wedge, but short ball trade for those instruments could, could tag those upper levels as the VIX itself, you know, bases out and finishes out that wedge. I, I, I think that's very plausible, honestly, with what I'm looking at on a day over day basis last couple of weeks. So, you know, for what it's worth, my two cents, I, I don't, I wouldn't be short VIX anymore. Um, if you have been short VIX, I would probably, you know, if you want to ride the SVXY long, you probably have to stop. But I think that uh, that I can I can actually see into the summer. Uh, what, were you the one talking about June? Yes. Right? I, no, yeah, I, I, I think we actually have a little um, pullback after this options expiration. I, f I yeah. feel that this is um, keeping it aloft, if you will, through next Wednesday's VIX expiration and then Friday's um, end of and you know April expiration. Then I think we should get some volatility coming in. But yeah, that's yeah. My phone's in the other room. I didn't put it on mute. Apologies. That's uh, okay. Um, but I still see also bonds are weak. I don't have this uh, this feeling of safety at all that we're done no. going down in uh, okay. in bonds. So I update this TLT and the, the the USB, which I'll show in a minute. But I still see TLT heading down to this. Minimum 130, 125, 120 area. And I think I've also shown this channel um, for a while where we're still not down. It, it, and I just feel like this is also a nice area to kind of turn when it does bounce, right? 
when it does bounce and then yields can you know pull down i'm i'm we're not there yet but we're getting i think i think you know it goes back to this is a this is a monetary science experiment and you know we're 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 really kind of out there and we don't know um well, what, the you know, what the reaction is at that level right there, right? Like it, it, this is a 42 to 45 year period that's you know, kind of culminating, right? And so the reaction at that trend line right there is really important. And then, you know, the reaction over the next six to 12 months as it relates to bonds is hugely important for years to come. But this, so. is, the, this is the thing, we know how pensions will react. If, if bond yields, uh, you know, we have this inflationary backdrop of over 2%, pushing 3%. I showed that chart at the beginning where expectations are now that the CPI will run above 3% for the next five years. Where What are, what are bond holders going to do? They don't mm. make money in that environment. They're going to be sucking wind. <laughs> this yeah. is, so they're going to be, I think, transitioning out. But this is definitely, they're front running that. In the same way that inflation expectations are running higher with yields, the bond bubble has definitely gotten some froth let out, and now it's going to be approaching soon. It's not even there yet, right? That 125 for TLT, for example, will be a huge bounce area. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and every area that we come close to bouncing is where I think now the market's going to pull back, <laughs> but we're not there yet. Yeah, no, nope, and then there's just no volatility. And without, with the absence of volatility, you continue to rotate. Okay, <laughs> so, well, but we do have some potential um, volatility coming in. And this is, I will show my like secret thing, not secret thing, but I really think that we're going to have volatility come in. I just have to find the bloody chart. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Is this it? Is this close enough? Yeah, that's close enough. All right, and then we'll uh, comment on a few things in chat. Um, this is a kind of a, a stock bond. You can see UST, which I just showed you on that 45 year time frame. Remember how it's coming mm -hmm. down? Okay, and this is SPX. We know SPX is going up. <laughs> we're, we're, we're pushing 4,000 and we're going, when does it slow down? So this is a heck of a wedge. Can you see this? Yep. All right. So we're tagging right here. And I don't think it's going to take very long for it to start wiggling out of that wedge. So that's why I think. We've got a week and a half at best, maybe Thursday the 15th. And I don't know what event would be the catalyst to drive some volatility, but technically speaking, that's a hell of a wedge. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, totally. So um, I don't know what the event will be, but that that's my technical read, for lack of a better. Um, well, they didn't. It, they moved tax day. So don't worry about that. That's right. Yeah. They move that, so that's you know everything that can be moved or punted or or or, or set aside has been changed. I'm hoping you know. I'll get a little bit more insight um, when we talk with uh, with Barton on Thursday because this Treasury plumbing you know liquidity issue is definitely right now um, so big and burdensome. Yes. Like it's the supply of money in the system is too much to process <laughs> on one hand. Um, it's the weight of it, if you will, the weight of issuance is, uh, is, is, is tightening is actually I think a kind they of, did. Kind of tightening. So we got to, they did, to they did like way more than they, you know, needed to do last year. And that's what they do. They just do more and they can't take it back. So the adverse consequence to me this is the last thing I'll say is that you get plumbing issues related to inflation issues related to interest rate issues and the, that's that's where they're sitting is like you know they, they, i don't think they know what they have in their hands so i'm very curious to hear what he has to say um in regards to that i, I really am because he's he's got the whole he built a whole system around monitoring it right then it's really it slick. very cool and he's noticed you know the the uh the fractal if you will of this treasury supply or imbalance divergence and how the market reacts bullish or bearish so it's it's pretty cool so yeah we'll do that next friday but for right now the answer the big question of what's a good hedge for inflation the 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 core question will be do we really have sustainable inflation because there is still a very solid argument that we will be hit with deflation that the yields will be tapped down 
that some, maybe it's COVID restrictions, maybe it's geopolitical, you know, it could be all kinds of um, unforeseen shocks um, or out of control, like oil spikes, what have you, or short covering in the dollar or, uh, you know, a continued rate of change that's strong in the yield um, market that, you know, sends all kinds of reverberations, especially for those tech holders where, who don't know that they're really trading the duration, right? Tech is a duration trade. They don't realize it's a bond proxy. So if, if yields or dollar or geopolitical or plumbing and liquidity, what have you, um, starts to actually pick up a narrative, we will have deflation before the next round of inflation. So it's got it's got to be fluid. It is not just one directional. It feels like that, right? It, it feels like that. And I think it's been used as a hedge, but we still have to get real inflation in CPI and sustainable inflation. And I think this this movement into metals, uh, for example, um, has been front run. So the grains and the metals and such that we've talked about, and especially copper, um, but other, you know, other metals as well has definitely been um, the hedge that has been, has been paying. <laughs> it's been very profitable on any time frame right now, but it's still, you can see from the charts, it has a lot of work to, to jump the shark of that multi-decade lows right now. Commodities are right hitting that one big huge trend line that it has not been able to get above and stay above. So you know it's guilty until proven innocent yeah so, totally agree but thank you um okay so we will talk on thursday with barton and um we, we definitely have to get a little bit more insight into um what you know what's going on here with the administration and job wage inflation because that seems very much more uh, you know realistic and I think a few have already mentioned in here that this is definitely uh, not going away. Wage inflation's coming again with all the other things we've talked about. So yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, uh, Sir, watch that put in there about uh, about unions and stuff like that. It, just before we before we head off, I I, I would say that the, the you can push that stuff through, but the the reaction for. Um, Let's say in the in the southern states where you don't have a lot of unionization, like uh, you do have a lot more in the northern states and the central central states. It's like it's going to be hard to push um, like the minimum, federal minimum wage stuff down um, with the consumer goods price not being able to be tit for tat. Like it's 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 straightforward to push it wage inflation through if you can raise the price of the goods. You can't raise the price of goods because nobody can afford them because you got inflation and you got the price of the raw good goes up on your p on your p and l and it you know sucks you dry and then you raise the the rate so you you drive the businesses out of business because you take all the margin so unless they can allow for um the margin to go up right in association with the wages and the and the actual inflation as relates to the the, the raw goods on a on a product creation spectrum then you cannot uh you know it doesn't work it just simply the math doesn't work and the businesses won't won't hire the people so they'll keep one fire too um and so they keep the best one and so, i mean i've seen that you know play out extensively in the last 15 years in my career so what what i would say is it really would be dependent upon getting wages to rise as it relates to universal basic income so if you if you do that then you know that the reaction is going to be that the people are going to be let go um, then you've got to be able to subsidize the income across the board so that people can actually pay for those goods that you're increasing in price through the engineering mechanism itself of forcing the prices to go up. But if you force the prices to go up without compensating the mechanism for which they do, i.e. the business and the business owners and the business enterprise itself, then the business will either close or the business will not be able to deliver that good and um, you know make their adverse reaction. So if it were that simple, it would work. It's just not. So that, and I'm pretty hard stop on that, right? It doesn't yeah, and, work. And and John is, is Biden isn't just talking. He says he actually believes in unions, and it's not a campaign line. He believes in in you know wages are going to rise. So this is all contributing to that cycle too of uh, business prosperity or sustainability. Um, to can't can't engineer it. Just can't. It, it, you can you can you can engineer. I would say you could kind of kind of quasi engineer it where you got a little bit going on where where you've got. Uh, Let's say you had the fiscal and the monetary at the same at opposite times, 
right? You could raise wages, but not have finished like the product, uh, the raw good components rising. So if I got, you know, say like, it takes me sugar, coffee and something else, soybeans to make what I'm making. And those are all raging going up. And then you tell me I have to raise my wages, right? So like, but I can't raise my prices. Somebody's got to go, right? Something's got to give. And so that's really what happens. And so I think that, I think that, um, you know, it's, if you have one lever of those, like if I just raise wages, then it would work just like monetary versus fiscal, but fiscal and monetary cause a different reaction. Wages plus raw goods going up at the same time, not allowing prices to go up. That doesn't work. So if prices go up too, then it works. Right. And I'm, I'm actually um, copying and pasting a comment by Peter who says, check out the Chapwood Index for a truer idea of prices on a range of goods people use in cities across the USA. Inflation yep. by this mu measure runs closer to 9 to 12 percent. Yeah, 100 percent. So it's like you have because you have to raise the price of the goods to accommodate for raw good and wage inflation. So it's, there's no other outcome. There's just zero other outcome until things become so unaffordable that you can't get it. But raising them $15 minimum wage doesn't solve it. Like that's not a, that's that's just that's the that's ensuring that people are able to go to the grocery store. That doesn't systemically fix across the board, you know, wage disparity as it relates to you know uh, home ownership or whatever. That's just raising the lower tier of income up to a level where it's actually sustainable at this point. So you know the the cost of everything goes up. So we just really reset the field. That's why I think that that they're talking about Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. and this is my opinion because the, this isn't this isn't this is an accomplishable mathematical formulation. It doesn't work. They, if they would have to reset prices across the board to create some parity to where you could then kind of let the mechanisms of an economy work again. And I know that I think they know that. I think I think I, they know that. I think the two things that uh, that don't get enough play, at least in my travels, I know I read all kinds of you know economic analysis and and the rest, and I'm doing my thing with technical and intermarket and sentiment. But at the core, I think a lot of people pass over you know the climate crisis or the social crisis and the social crisis which is the whole premise for this Bretton Woods type of revisit right and this yeah. corporate tax globally that Yellen just out of the blue you know talked about um, so this social crisis is what is trying to be you know addressed is gonna yeah I think that's 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 your point right yes yeah 100 yeah. percent yeah 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 totally all right, Brett. Okay, so I think we should. I don't even know. <laughs> There's, you got to go look at Yellen. Yellen mentioned it this morning. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. With who? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yellen came out talking about there has to be a minimum. It, it was. It was like it was like a full blown press release statement that she made this morning. So it was wow. very wild. I was kind of. I was like taken aback. I was like. What? I was like, that's a reach. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it was, uh, it was bold. I mean, it's a, you know, go fish test. Uh, you know, see what the. The bots yeah, pick up and respond to We're approaching with China, but we should, we're going to somehow get across a, uh, you know, climate crisis, um, social crisis. It's all going to be wrapped up in a nice package somehow <laughs> under this administration. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit, a little bit out there. All right. So we're going to, we're going to close here, but um, on Thursday, Barton comes in. We'll talk um, all things, you know, Fed liquidity, uh, treasury and how the plumbing really works. And I wish you a great rest of the trading week. Thank you, Jonathan. And everybody Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody, for your comments. Great comments. Great thoughts. Yeah, and, we'll, and we'll talk separately about um, the disruptor stocks, you know, like the Roku and the Wix and then all that kind of stuff another time, because I think that that's... Um, we can look at them next week and we'll look at the yeah. options on them. That's yeah, what you really got. You guys got to be looking at the options on the momentum stuff and the beta stuff. Like, that's the key. And they are really, you know, there's tons of stuff in their action every day. So that's what I would say. Yeah. And look it's also, options. there's a time to trade into that. Um, yep. And there's a time, you know, it's rotation all the time. So right now that's getting a little burst since the 31st because April's seasonally strong and the Qs, the gamma went positive again. Um, uh, Raul Powell came out saying he's buying ARC and disruptor yep. stocks. So there were all kinds of signals to support that move. Let's see if we get any follow through. Yep. Okay. All, right. all right. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Take care.